Hello, I'm John. Welcome to my blacksmith shop. We don't get very many visitors around here, so it's really good to see you. Now, before we go in, there are just a few safety rules that we should be aware of at a blacksmith shop, or just about any shop for that matter. The first one is that everything in the shop should be considered to be hot. Even though it doesn't look hot to your eyes, it can still be more than hot enough to burn you or even melt a hole in your clothes. So don't touch anything that isn't specifically handed to you that you know is cold. Now kind of along with that is lots of this stuff is kind of sharp. It's been cut on saws and hasn't been cleaned up. So there can be little sharp spots on the ends of bars and things like that. So you have to be very careful not to cut yourself. Just about everything in the shop is heavy. And that means it can hurt you. If you drop it on your foot, it could hurt your toes, your foot, you could pinch a finger, it could just hurt your back. Not trying to pick things up that you shouldn't be touching is pretty darn important. Finally, it's all pretty much filthy, dirty. Blacksmith shops tend to be dirty places because I work with coal and charcoal and things like that. And it's all gonna get your clothes absolutely filthy if you start messing around with stuff. But if you just watch and look and only handle the things that are passed around for you to look at, you should be pretty safe. And of course, everybody should be wearing safety glasses. That's a very important rule in a blacksmith shop. It's nice to have earplugs or other hearing protection, but safety glasses are an absolute must. Now, the good thing today is that you're probably watching this tour at home, so you're okay on just about all of that stuff. But if you ever get to come to the shop in person, try to remember those safety rules. But for now, why don't we head inside and see what's going on? For my regular viewers in the crowd, today's video is going to be something just a little bit different. We're going to have a virtual visit to the blacksmith shop for those that are homeschooling or doing summer day camp from home. Whatever the case is that the younger crowd is stuck at home and doing things online, this is a chance to visit a blacksmith shop if you can't get out and visit one in your own area. So regardless of your age or why you decided to stop in today, Welcome to the shop, and we're going to get on with our little tour. A logical place to begin is just what is blacksmithing? How is blacksmithing different than other forms of metalworking? Is it different than being a welder or a machinist or somebody who makes cast iron things? And the answer is yes, it is a little bit different than those things. Blacksmiths primarily work with iron-based metals, so that's wrought iron and steel. Various forms of steel being the most common thing that we use today here in the blacksmith shop. Most of the work we do is on material that is so hot, it is somewhat plastic and somewhat like clay, and it can be shaped with some force between hammer and anvil. There are other tools like power hammers and presses and things like that that will also be used at times in a shop. But the main tools really are the hammer, the anvil, and a source of heat to get the material hot enough, which is extremely hot. It needs to be a bright red or an orange heat, and that's somewhere between 1500 and 1800 degrees, so it's extremely hot. And that's why I told you before coming into the shop to be careful about what you touch, because it's really easy to get burned. Even as things cool down and look like they're not hot anymore, they are still plenty hot enough to burn you. In contrast, a machinist will typically take a block of material and cut away what they don't need. So somewhere in that block has to be the finished product that they want and they cut away all the excess stuff and they can be very precise, very accurate that way. Modern machine methods are really a great way of making precision parts, but it lacks some of the freedom that a blacksmith has. A welder, on the other hand, can bring things together and join them by using modern welding techniques, but they generally don't completely reshape a material. They don't start with something big and heavy and make it small and thin and they don't start with something that's maybe a little bit too light and make it heavier and thicker. But those things are exactly what we can do in a blacksmith shop and exactly why blacksmithing has a certain amount of versatility and leaves a certain character to the work that some of these other things don't have. What then is it that blacksmiths actually do these days? Now when I started blacksmithing, that was about 36 years ago, Everybody thought blacksmiths just made horseshoes, 
Well, 36 years later, I have yet to actually make a horseshoe or put a shoe on a horse. So I don't do that, and that's actually called being a farrier. And while blacksmiths did a lot of farrier work back in the day, it isn't necessarily what makes a blacksmith. Now today we have a show out on TV called Forged in Fire, so everybody thinks blacksmiths make knives. And I've made a fair number of knives, never made a sword, but I have made some knives, but I don't make a whole lot of them anymore because it's not really what interests me as a blacksmith. What kind of things do blacksmiths do then if they're not making horseshoes and knives? Well, in my shop, I like to make tools. I make things like this gouge for woodworking. I make some axes and hatchets, things like that. I make things like door hardware, hinges and handles and latches, things like that. Occasionally something like a nice big candle holder. Just whatever I kind of feel like. There's lots of stuff people can do in a blacksmith shop that aren't really so easy for a welder or a machinist simply because of the differences in the way people do things. That doesn't make blacksmithing better than either of those, it's just different. Let's take a look at some of the tools in the shop, the different forges, see what an anvil looks like, and let's actually make something. The anvil is kind of the centerpiece of the blacksmith shop. It is the surface on which most of the work is done. This particular anvil is about 300 pounds. I know somebody was just dying to ask that question. The top here is where most of the work is done, but if you need to do some bending or some other special operations, the horn comes in handy. We'll take a look at how that horn works and what you might use it for. And of course, a hammer is the thing that you use on the anvil to shape the steel. And there are just a huge variety of hammers. I don't know how many hammers I have here in the shop. They're all a little bit different. They all do one thing or another a little bit better. So blacksmiths tend to collect quite a few hammers. And while the anvil may be the centerpiece of the shop, Probably the heart of the blacksmith shop is the forge or the hearth, the place where you go to get material hot. This is a coal forge. I burn coal in it, although you could burn charcoal. There's a few other solid fuels that you can burn. And when I say charcoal, I mean hardwood charcoal, not the stuff you put in your backyard barbecue. And this has to have a fire hot enough to get material soft so that you can work it between the hammer and the anvil. I also have a forge that runs on propane, and that's a good way to get things hot. And depending on what I'm doing, I'll pick and choose which forge I'm going to work in. Also, time of year a little bit. During the winter, the propane forge helps heat the shop a little bit better, and I kind of like that. So before any work can happen in the shop, we got to get a fire going. And everybody's got their favorite way of starting a fire in the forge. Some people use a torch, some people just use a match and a piece of paper like this. Depending on the day and if it's been cold and wet, I'll change what I do. I like to add a little bit of wood to the fire. That just helps get a hot fire before I add any coal. As that starts to burn, I can bring stuff in from the outside here. And you see all this kind of nasty smoke? That's actually fresh coal burning, and that's not what we typically burn in the fire. I mentioned that we can burn charcoal in the forge as well as coal. And charcoal is really just wood that's been cooked at a high heat, and it's transformed it into a little bit different material, more of a pure carbon material. 
And we can do the same thing with coal. Coal, as I put it in the forge, is hard and it's shiny and it's heavy, but it converts to what we call coke. Coke is then just a pure carbon form that's light and kind of fluffy and it burns clean, it doesn't smoke. So coke is to coal what charcoal is to wood. And it's the coke that we really want to burn in the forge and it converts as we bring fuel in at the edge of the fire. If I do everything just right, this fire should hardly smoke at all. Rarely is that the case, but that's my goal. So let's get to the part you've been waiting for. Let's look at some hot iron. I'm gonna start with something really simple. Let's just make a little S hook. They're really handy to have around the house. I use them over the campfire for cooking. Lots of things you can do with an S hook. And we'll talk about a few basic blacksmithing techniques as we make our S hook. My forge, by the way, has an electric blower on it instead of the bellows that you would have seen in a lot of old movies. Bellows work very well, but they're big, they take up a lot of space, and you have to stand there and pump them the whole time. I can just flip a switch and turn on the blower. So we have a nice hot piece of material, and we're going to start just by drawing this out. Drawing out is making something longer and skinnier. And it's a good way to make a little taper in a piece. Now just to give our S-hook a little bit more interest, I'm going to bend the end and put just a little scroll. So this is another technique blacksmiths can use, is bending and scrolling. Next thing you want to do is bend it into a hook. So I'm going to heat it back up again and get enough material hot. And no, I'm not touching it, that would burn me. I'm going to get enough material hot to make the hook. I cool the tip in a little water in case I accidentally hit it. This is some place we can use the horn of the anvil to help shape this. And I'm not really trying to forge it out over the horn, I'm just trying to bend it over the horn. And that becomes a very good place to do that and kind of straighten it out. And there is our hook for our S-hook. Let's do the same thing on the other end. So this starts just exactly the same way. I'm going to put the little curl on there because I still have just enough heat in there to do that. Neaten that up a little bit. Sometimes blacksmiths will make special tools to make their lives a little bit easier and get the work done faster. This is just a little jig I use for bending S-hooks. This doesn't need to be real hot to bend around a jig like this. But I see I have made a mistake. I can even tap on this a little bit to clean that up. I don't have an S-hook, that's more of a C-hook. Nobody uses C-hooks. What are we gonna do about it? This will be an excellent opportunity to take a look at another blacksmithing technique that we call twisting. And for that, we're going to take a look at another tool that you find in most blacksmith shop, and that is a vise, or in this case, a post vise or a leg vise. That's because it has a leg that goes all the way to the ground. So if you're hammering on it, like most blacksmiths tend to do, all that energy goes to the ground instead of damaging your vise. But for twisting, we don't need to hammer on it. This is just a matter of putting it in the vise. And then I use another special tool, just happens to be called a twisting wrench. And I can twist it and put a nice decorative twist in here and stop so that I now have an S-hook. So I've gone one and a half full turns. 
It did bend my hook up a little bit, but we're blacksmiths. We know how to fix this kind of stuff. This is all things that we can take care of because the hot is hot material is very soft and very easy to work with. So there is a very quick, very simple S hook with a decorative twist in the middle. Now before we go on too much further, I thought maybe we should take a look at some of the other tools in the shop. You may have noticed that I was holding that S hook with this pair of tongs, and let's talk about tongs just a little bit. Maybe look at some of the other tools that are very unique to blacksmithing that you don't find in too many other styles of shops. As I prepare to do that, it might be a great time to hit the pause button, maybe take a bathroom break, get a snack, and come right back because I'll be ready to go as soon as you hit that play button again. Is everybody back? Don't want any stragglers. We were about to talk about tongs. Tongs aren't anything more than really long specialty pliers that hold certain things. This pair of tongs holds that material we were making the S-hook out of very tight so I can work with it and it holds it that way and it holds it this way. Works very well. But if I use this pair of tongs, it doesn't hold it at all. It just falls out of there, and that would be very dangerous in the shop to have tongs that don't fit. So tongs come in lots of different varieties, or I should say you can make tongs in lots of different varieties, because a lot of these tongs I have made here in the shop, some of them are store-bought because they, they are available out there. But oftentimes when a blacksmith needs a special pair of tongs, it's easier to just make them than it is to wait for them to be delivered in the mail. So we can have box jaw tongs, these are slotted jaw tongs, these are V-bit or bolt tongs because there's room for a bolt head up here in this area. There are flat tongs that hold sheet metal and flat things. There are tongs that are bent over that are good for working on certain tools and rings and things like that. So lots of different tongs. In this shop, I probably have over a hundred different pairs of tongs, each one kind of specialized just for what it does. And even then, sometimes I still don't have exactly the pair of tongs I want. I either have to make a new set or I can get these hot and reforge them and make them into the tongs that I need. I can just reshape them a little bit if they're close. So in blacksmith shops, you're gonna see lots and lots of tongs. I talked earlier about hammers, and in just a minute or two, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the different kinds of hammers that you might find in a blacksmith shop. But let's talk about some things that look like hammers, but aren't. These things have handles like hammers do, they look like they could be swung like a hammer, and I suppose if you wanted to, you could swing them like a hammer. And the truth is, in some countries, they refer to these as hammers, even though they aren't swung and they aren't used like a hammer. Well, what these are are tools that are held on the work at the anvil and then struck with another hammer. They're often referred to as set tools. And generally, it's not the blacksmith swinging the other hammer. This is usually done by an assistant, an apprentice, often referred to as a striker. I don't actually have a striker in my shop, so I don't use tools like this much at the anvil. If I need to, I can swing a hammer and hold stuff, but it's a lot easier sometimes to hold the material you're working with the tongs in one hand, hold this tool in your other hand, and then have a striker. So what do I do if I need a striker? I can resort to this tool, which is called a treadle hammer. That's because it has this foot treadle that swings the hammer head up and down. And I can hold the material in one hand, I can hold the tool in the other hand, and I can strike with the treadle hammer. Have to get it hot first though. These handled set tools or top tools are made in different varieties. They aren't all the same. One with a round shape here is referred to as a swedge. And they are often used in pairs so that you can put one in the anvil and one on top and use them that way. This particular tool is a flatter and it's just used for smoothing things between the hammer and the anvil. This is a chisel or a hot chisel made to be used for cutting hot material and you can have punches. Lots of other tools are made this way. The principle is always the same. 
they set on the work and then they are struck with another hammer. Might be why they call them set tools, but don't quote me on that. Now if a tool with a round hollow in it, a concave surface, is a swedge, a similar tool with a convex surface, or the round is on the outside, is referred to as a fuller. And you notice these fit in this square hole on the anvil. Somebody was probably thinking, why does an anvil have a square hole on it? Well, that's why it holds tools. This is referred to as a hardy hole, and the hardy itself is a tool like this. It is a chisel, and it sits in the hardy hole. And the hardy then is used for cutting material, which cutting is another technique blacksmiths can use. And I don't cut all the way down because I don't want to damage my hammer on the hardy or damage the cutting edge of the hardy with my hammer. So I come back and I just break that off. But that's a very quick and efficient way for blacksmiths to cut things when they're already working hot at the anvil instead of letting it cool and then going to a saw. And just like the top tools, there are lots of different bottom tools or hardy tools that can go in the square hole in the anvil. The companion hole, the round hole, is often referred to as a pritchel hole. And a pritchel is a special punch used by horseshoers to punch the holes in a horseshoe for the nails. So this is something that comes about because blacksmiths did do a lot of horseshoeing at one point. Today we still use that mostly for punching holes. And it's a place where you can drive a punch through a piece of material instead of drilling a hole. You can punch and the pritchel hole is a handy place to drive the punch through if the punch fits. It's got its limits, but it's not bad. Maybe we ought to take a look at that too. Now to punch a hole through a piece of steel, we just need a punch the shape we want. It doesn't have to be a round hole. A drill press only drills a round hole. And I start punching through like that. And I end up with a nice dent there. And I cool my punch off in a little bit of water. Because this is a square punch, I gotta make sure I line it up just right. A round punch, it's a little bit easier. And I start on the back side in the same location. And then when it's starting to go through, I can bring it over the pritchel hole. And I can punch the slug out through the pritchel hole. And that leaves a square hole in a bar. And just like with tongs, blacksmiths tend to make their own punches and you make them whatever size, whatever shape you need. I have square punches, round punches, oval punches, slotted punches, some that are kind of teardrop shaped. It's just whatever you need in a punch, whatever kind of hole you need to put in a piece of material. And that's one of the advantages blacksmiths have over machinists and welders that generally can just drill round holes. So punching then is another one of the basic skills of a blacksmith. Before we look at another technique, I thought I would talk a little bit more about hammers. Like I said, lots of different size hammers. For handheld hammers, I have hammers that range from maybe four ounces, little tiny hammers, to 14 pounds, which would be the hammer swung by that striker or the apprentice helping you strike top tools. Typically, I work with about a three pound hammer. This one is three pounds. And that was made by another blacksmith. That's not one I made, not one I bought at the store, but another blacksmith made that for me. You'll find some characteristics on blacksmithing hammers that you may have on some of the hammers you have laying around the house, and maybe you don't completely understand what those are for or why they're there. Things like this part here, which is referred to as the peen. This is a cross peen hammer because it goes crossways to the handle. This is a ball peen hammer because the peen is shaped like a ball. So what do those peens do and why is that significant? Have you ever helped in the kitchen, maybe rolling out biscuit dough or pie crust and you use that rolling pin and if the thing starts to get egg shaped and not go in the direction you want, you turn the rolling pin and push it off in another direction? Well, that's what this is. This is your rolling pin in the blacksmith shop and that peen stretches material in one way. All the force is concentrated and it forces the material to go across the peen. It spreads more this way than it does this way. Ball peen then spreads equally in all directions. And of course the face of the hammer spreads equally in all directions, but not as dramatically. So I got another piece of material in the fire here. And I think we're gonna make another style of hook 
And while we do that, we're going to draw out the hook end over the horn of the anvil. Why are we going to do that? Because it has that same round shape like a rolling pin does, and it's going to help us draw that out and make it longer, a little faster, and a little bit more efficiently. Just like the peen of the hammer. And if I want to, I can use that cross peen with the horn and really draw it out fast. It leaves it a little bit choppy, so we'll have to go to the face of the anvil and clean that up. But that leaves a nice taper. I think this time, though, I'm going to round this taper up and that brings up a general principle in blacksmithing that first you forge it out in square, then you make it octagon by knocking the corners down so it goes from four-sided to eight-sided. Then you round that up. And it's a lot easier to keep things neat and round and even if you go square, octagon, round. So that's drawn out square. And I'm gonna knock the corners down and make it octagon. And then I'm going to round it up just by rolling it. I just roll the tongs in my hand like that. Make that just as smooth as I want to, or leave it a little bit textured for more character, depending on what I'm after. And just like we did before, I'm going to put the little curly cue or rat tail, some people call it, on the end, just to make it look better. And then we'll bend a hook. I promise we are getting to the part where we're going to talk a little bit more about the cross peen and the ball peen and show you some of the things I might use them for. Now for this hook, I think I will use this thing that goes in the hardy hole. It's referred to simply as a bending fork. And this works a lot like that other bending jig, but it doesn't give you a specific size. You have to kind of work with it. And like some of the other tools, there are top versions as well as bottom versions, so you can get exactly what you want and make a nice hook that way. Straighten that just a little bit. Now this one's round material, so there's no reason to twist it. If you twist round material, it just looks round. But I'm going to do something different on the other end, so this one can be attached to the wall with a screw. Now I'm going to start this just over the edge of the anvil and the hammer is going to be half on and half off the anvil so I can push that down and create a little shoulder there. These are called half face blows, but I want to spread this more one way than I do the other. So I'm going to go to the peen of the hammer and I can start spreading this. And that makes something that we'll be able to put a hole in for a screw hole or a nail hole. And with the ball peen, if I need it, I can kind of pull this out and shape it and get it just a little bit more round right where I want it. And because I'm working all from the back side, all these hammer marks aren't going to be distracting on the front side. So that leaves me something that we can put a hole in. Now this is so thin, if I tried to punch it over that pritchel hole, I would just bend it and drive it down in there. So instead I'm going to punch it over this plate with a hole. I get a nice round screw hole that way. There's our hole all the way through there. So that's a hole clear through. Haven't used any power tools to do this other than the electric blower on the forge. I don't know if we can find it. 
right there is the little teeny tiny slug or biscuit that came out of the punched hole. Now that's most of the basic techniques that a blacksmith uses. There are a few others, but they're all more or less based on those same things. And you can create all sorts of different things. You can make a bar longer and skinnier. You can make a square bar round. You can make a round bar square. You can make a bar shorter and fatter. You can bend it. You can scroll it. You can twist it. You can cut it. Lots of things you can do with a piece of steel. One technique we did not look at is welding. And we've talked about modern welders that use electric welders or torches to weld with. But a blacksmith can use the forge fire to weld with simply by getting material so hot that it is close to the melting point and then bring them together and hammer them together. Some people call it fire welding. Some people call it hammer welding. I just refer to it as forge welding. And it is a very old technique. People have been welding that way for thousands of years. Matter of fact, wrought iron, which is the material that was used by blacksmiths for thousands of years, isn't still being made today, but it was made through a forge welding process. But I think demonstrating forge welding will be a topic for another video. So if you folks enjoyed this little visit to the shop, you're welcome to come back. We'll do this again. But don't leave yet. I'd still like to talk to you a little bit about how you might be able to try this safely at home without forge, hammer, anvil, fire, hot metal, or any of that stuff. And we'll do that after we take just another little short break. So if you need a bathroom break, you need another snack break, or just need to stretch your legs because you're getting tired, go do that and we'll come right back. Okay, once again, everybody back. No stragglers, ready to go again, good. So how do you experiment with some of this at home and get a better understanding of how steel moves without needing to have a fire, hot steel, sharp stuff, heavy hammers, damaging the furniture, the floors, getting everything filthy? I gave you that answer earlier on in the video, and that is that hot iron is kind of plastic, kind of like clay, and if you've got some clay, we can make this work. I'm using plasticine, but you know, Play-Doh would work just fine. The plasticine doesn't seem to dry out the way Play-Doh does, so in some ways it's, it's better, but whatever you happen to have around the house should work. So this is just a piece of the, the plasticine, and it is soft, and it's probably about as soft as iron is. Play-Doh is probably softer, so it'd be easier to work with, but this is something that you can can work with. And if you don't have a hammer you can use and you don't have an anvil and all that, this is soft enough you might be able to hammer it out by hand. You're going to have to turn it back and forth to get it to behave, but I can draw that out. I can use a little piece of wood as an anvil and get a small hammer if I want to. You don't have to work this super hard. A little toy hammer, a wooden hammer, rubber mallet, all those things would probably work. Now this won't behave exactly like hot iron does, but it's pretty darn close and you can try a lot of things out with this. You can roll this end over and make your little curly cue. It's not going to harden and stay the same and you're not going to be able to make useful projects, but you can try some of these techniques out. And this is not a bad way to do that. Let's uh, go a little further here and draw this out some more. And just using your hands, because you don't have a vise, you can put a twist in this. Now what if you want to try some different twists with this stuff? Well, you can forge weld all this right back together into a mass of wrought iron if you want to. hammer that back out into a nice square. And this is one thing blacksmiths can do that most other people can't, is just completely change the shape of their material to suit whatever their needs are. Don't have exactly the size you want? You can fix that. Now one end of this, if you're watching, try to keep that in the camera, is fatter than the other. And here's a technique we did not talk about earlier and that is upsetting. Upsetting is when you work from the ends usually to make something shorter and fatter. And you have to be careful not to get it to fold over. 
because this is what we call a cold shut as a blacksmith, and that will usually cause a problem. Not going to cause a problem with your clay, but in hot iron that could be a problem, so you need to really pay attention to that and work those out before they get sealed up into the material. So now I've got a nice little bar here. You notice it's got some cracks along the edge. That's very typical of what actual wrought iron would do. Now if you have something like a butter knife or a plastic modeling knife or something like that, you can do that with this. This is what you would do with a chisel. Cut down from the top like this, hot using a hammer, and you could chisel a line down the middle of that. But if you don't have a, an actual chisel, you can just score a line like this. The deeper you make it, the more dramatic this might become. So I've got a line now down all four sides, and now when I twist this, you end up with a line down the middle of the twist that makes that a much more dramatic twist and really adds some interest. So in blacksmithing, that's a really good technique. And you can experiment with running that close to the edges, right down the center, just down one side, just down two edges real close to each other. You can make the bar into kind of a diamond shape and try it that way. Experiment with the clay and just try things. You can do those half-face blows, you can use the ball peen if you're using a hammer, or again use your thumb like a ball peen and you can squish it out the way you want to. And there's your little shoulder for your, for your hook that we did. It shows you how that might work. And one of the things I showed you early on in the video that I had made is a little hatchet. Now how is that done? And this is something we can do in the clay. Remember I told you everything in the blacksmith shop gets dirty? Well, my piece of clay here is already starting to turn black because it's taken all the dirt out of my fingers. And that's something that always a problem in the blacksmith shop is filthy hands and filthy clothes. But let's, uh, let's make a little axe out of this. And this is some place that forge welding would be used. I'm going to make a little bar out of here. So this is the way axes would have been made way back when. I'm going to take this, I'm going to use some half-face blows on the edge of the anvil. And I'm going to spread that out, and I'm going to turn it up this way, and I'm going to go to this edge of the anvil, and do some more half-face blows. So I have a shoulder on both sides. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. It goes a lot faster in the clay than it does in iron, but you really get the idea. And now I got this piece with the shoulders, and if I wrap that up, I can then forge weld this together at the anvil. And I can shape this, and I can stand it up a little bit here, and work this down. It'd take a lot more work to, to actually make an axe out of this, but you kind of get the idea there. And if you need to, you can upset this back down a little bit to keep getting out of the camera here. But that's sort of how that axe was made. Not exactly. There's a lot more work to making an axe than this is. And oftentimes, because not every kind of steel can be hardened and will hold a good cutting edge for a tool, a blacksmith will then forge weld in a higher quality steel, and that way you can get the benefit of the high quality steel right at the cutting edge where it needs to be without investing all that good steel in the body of the tool where it doesn't need to be hardened. And that was really important two, three hundred years ago when materials were incredibly expensive. Now materials aren't so expensive and labor is very expensive, so sometimes that's not the best way to go. But it is one technique, and it's something I still do a lot just so I can make tools the way they used to be made. So use your imagination, try different things. You can roll this up into a tube to make it look like a candle holder like I showed you at the beginning of the video. You can draw it out into thin material for hooks. You can make decorative leaves out of it. You can do all sorts of things 
using the clay instead of hot iron. Now, if you really think you want to learn about blacksmithing and actually get into hot iron, one, absolute adult supervision, mom and dad's permission all the way, don't do anything on your own, because it can be really dangerous to try and build a forge in your backyard. The best idea is to find somebody teaching a class. And if you're in the United States, the Artist Blacksmithing Association of North America, or ABANA, has affiliate groups throughout the country, and these groups are the ones that will be teaching classes or will know who is teaching classes. And they're the ones to get a hold of. Now, right now, with the current stay-at-home kind of stuff we've been doing, most of those classes have been canceled. But by this time next year, you should be able to find one if you're still interested. In the meantime, the internet is full of information on blacksmithing. I have quite a few videos that I've made here on YouTube about blacksmithing, but there are a lot of other blacksmiths out there, so I encourage you, if you're interested, to go ahead and watch some of those videos and just learn as much as you can. And if when things settle down, classes open up again, you're still interested, mom and dad say it's a good idea, maybe you can look into it at that point. But in the meantime, you can satisfy the itch to learn a little bit even if you don't have tools at home, even if you don't have an anvil, a forge, a shop, can't light a fire, you can still do this stuff in clay. And if you do it in clay that hardens, you can have little trinkets that you get to keep around and look at those ideas and go back and revisit those. Sometimes blacksmiths will work these ideas out in clay just to see if it really works because you're not out much in materials. You can scrunch it back up and do it again and try something different. And it really does help come up with ideas and try different things out. If you have any questions for me, feel free to ask down there in the comment section. I will try to answer. If there's a lot of questions or seems to be a lot of interest in doing a part two of this series, where maybe we'll look at some of the other bigger tools in the shop, like the power hammer, or maybe look at forge welding, and just see more of what really goes on in the blacksmith shop, I will consider doing that. But if you just have a simple question about a tool or an idea or something I said that I didn't quite explain well enough, Feel free to ask that question down in the comments section. I'll try to get all those questions answered in the next few days. In the meantime, have fun, stay safe, and if you are in the shop, wear your safety glasses. I'll see you later. Any questions, comments? No? Anybody? <laughs>